So uh, I'm going to make this talk with two threads. I'll throw two threads, and we'll try to tie them together. First, two questions. First question is, before we do that, maybe we should like, do something physiological and nice. Is it to take together a deep breath, <laughs> separate it all together, take a good deep breath. <sighs> so the first question is, why are there biochemical details? What do I mean by that? In every system we study, we love to study, A can only phosphorylate B when it's bound to C, not before. <laughs> only the active state of D works with E, and only when it's in the nucleus and not when... You see this in every system where we go into depth. So you can ask, why are these biochemical details? And I'll give you a very specific example. One, and now here is the subjective side of science. People have different points of view about how the world works. They bring to them before they come to science. And one point of view is, this is because evolution, it worked in the past, and that's the way it is in the present. And we don't need to ask more questions, we need to characterize this in detail. That's one way of thinking. Another way of thinking about it is, let's ask whether this has a specific, these details have a specific functional uh, effect that nothing, that no other details can do, basically. And then, that opens new questions, there is to say, what is this effect? Can we test it experimentally? Maybe we end up with the understanding that, ah, that's wrong. It is just history. But at least we can ask a new question. So we're going to do that for a specific system. The second, that's the first thread. The second thread I'm going to throw out is, can a signal transduction pathway work perfectly despite cell-to-cell -cell <coughs> variation in the concentrations of its components. That's the second question. And I mean perfectly. That is to say, it's not like it's in a limit or something. Absolute robustness. So let's start with this here for a second, this question a little bit more about it. By the way, I want us to understand in the audience, because I'm going to say some biological words, um, who, and just don't be afraid to raise your hand, isn't clear about what's phosphorylation, dephosphorylation. You can raise your hand if you <laughs> yes, come from outside science, right? So who here comes from what, physics, biology, chemistry? Good. Because it'll help me to explain it better. No, physics. Physics. You come from physics. How many people come from physics? These people, uh, are, as I mentioned, the work I'm going to come is graduate student Gai Shina, and it's based on really brilliant work by our very own Eric Bachelor, works in Galit's lab now, <coughs> Galit and uh, Mark Mark Gullian. <coughs> His paper in PNAS 2003, and this is in 2007. <coughs> So if you look at different cells, different cells, and you ask how much of a certain, certain protein there is, let's say a receptor or kinase, whatever, then as you know, uh, there's the average number, but not all cells that have the same number of proteins. There's variation between cell to cell, let's say of about 30% typically. And is that actually a concentration variation? Concentration I'm, variation. I'm, I'm asking because the issue with volume and volume yeah. measurement is Yeah, as far as we can tell, it's concentration variation. <laughs> and even if cells are exactly the same time of the cell cycle, on the same place in the mind with the microscope slide, under the same conditions with the same genomes, you still have this variability. 10%, 60%, depends on it. So the components are changing in concentration. But everything that single transaction <laughs> pathways do has to do with concentrations of interacting molecules. So in a single transduction pathway, <coughs> you know, just stereotypically, you have a receptor that sits outside the cell and inside the cell receives a signal from the outside world, and let's say, makes a chemical change to a signaling protein, like adding a phosphate group is called phosphorylation. This is the input, this is the output. For our purposes, let's imagine this is the output. The input, the output. The signal transduction, many signal transduction systems need to do the following. You give it the input, and it needs to calculate the output. Let's say the concentration of this 
some, something like this. I mean, it's, maybe it's a time response. We're just talking about a steady state response to the signal in this broad <coughs> discussion. So what's the problem? If in the cell, the concentration of x and the concentration of y and of other things, they typically vary <coughs> from cell to cell, and they last stay that way over entire cell generation, by the way, you can imagine that this curve, which depends on these concentrations, will also change from cell to cell. So a cell that has higher than average x, let's say, will have an input-output curve like this. And a cell that has a lower than average will have an input-output curve like this. So what? If we give the, c the cells the same signal, they'll have different outputs. Different outputs. Same signal, different outputs. Now that's OK in many cases. And some cells do have give different outputs to the same signal. But other cases, that can be catastrophic, especially if you're trying to measure something that you can't control, like where there's no feedback to close. If you want to read something very precisely, like the amount of osmotic, the osmolarity of the medium we're going to show, you don't want the cell to explode. And you can only measure the osmolarity, not what's, what you produce. Then you really want to know what it is. You want to have a good, accurate measurement of something from the outside. But this could be quite dangerous. So the question I'm asking here is, can you build a specific signaling, signaling reduction system where for all cells, despite the variations in the concentrations of x, y, etc., they have the same curve and give the same input to the same output. That's the question. Did I explain myself? That's yeah, was, it's not clear. You said some receptors have different uh, expressions. Some are very tight, some very broad. I, I can give you a simple solution. What is important, maybe? Okay. Let's have maybe it's tight. Thank you. So you're saying maybe make the, the, the things very tight. So when you look at actual cells, there's a limit to how tight you can make it, apparently. Yeah. 10% or something. Okay. So maybe you have correlation between how yeah. much essentiality and how much tight. That's great. And that could be, of course. And I'm going to tell you about a mechanism that absolutely doesn't depend. You can vary it by twofold, tenfold, and it still works perfectly. That's what I want to tell you about. Of course, it's, um, it's a theoretical construct. It's based on the real system. But at least it uh, gives you the possibility to do it. There's a the question. Really not yeah, the boards are not. Uh, they're kind of. So I'm going to get now. Let's talk about the biochemical details. So I'm going to um, first. What I'm going to do now is take this prototypical system, <coughs> solve it in just a minute, and show that the, almost all the signaling mechanisms we know so far uh, don't have this property. There aren't robots. And then I'm going to talk about a specific system uh, <coughs> that uh, Eric worked on experimentally and theoretically, continued theoretically, that has very specific biochemical features, really bizarre, well known, and see how it can help. So, what happens in this system now is going to be a little, a little equation. Uh, you don't have to follow the equation, just going to do it. This is the rate of change of this guy. And the kinase, x, is regulated by the signal, so its velocity, the, the rate, goes like to the function of the signal. So, <coughs> it's collisions between the kinase and the non phosphorylated one. And then uh, there's dephosphorylation. Maybe there's a, usually there's a special phosphatase actually that does this. And I'm gonna, you know, add a signal, there's more phosphorylation, let it reach steady state. Steady state means nothing is changing. And when you want to solve this, and you note that <coughs> phosphorylated and non-phosphorylated together have to make up the total amount of Y, the solution is that Y for the output is the total amount. And here you have the amount of kinase, X. This curve looks like this. But if I make more, that's it, if I make more Y, if I make more signaling protein, if that cell makes more signaling protein, <coughs> this whole curve goes up. See that? Because this is on top. The double YTA doubles up. Or if I make more X, the whole curve looks like this. So this kind of system is robust. Now you can play with it, make it first order, zero order. You can't get rid of the dependence of the output on concentrations. 